Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano, Investing 2020s, and this is the Punch Card Stock Quarterly Call. We were calling the Punch Card Stocks plug-and-play stocks uh, for the last couple of years. Originally, I was using the quarterly term, or I think I was doing it monthly for a while, Punch Card Stocks, uh, because of the idea that Warren Buffett had that if you could only pick 20 or 30 stocks out in your lifetime, you would truly learn the companies that you were investing in and you'd become a better investor. I got away from that uh, because people wanted to know what to do right now. I want to know what to do right now. Just tell me what to do. And I gave into that a little bit and now I'm taking it away. I'm going to give you some directions on how to handle things over the next quarter, each quarter. However, this idea that you can just walk in and say, oh, these are the 20 stocks I'm going to buy right now, and then I'm going to trade them a bunch and blah, 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 and I'm going to be rich because I know how to trade. Uh, well, it's all bullshit. And I've been trying to make the point to you that getting wealthy by trading is pretty much bullshit for 98% of you. So if you really want to generate wealth, you're going to take all these quotes from Buffett and Munger and Lynch, and you're going to start paying attention to them because patience and knowing what you're investing in is what truly makes you money. And I understand that a lot of people don't understand how to analyze a business. That's why we don't all do it for a living. Most of us have specific tasks in our jobs. We do this or we do that, and we do it a lot. And we become an expert on that thing. But as far as running an actual corporation and running a business in a way that it could be profitable, not only pay the wages and support the big skim by the executives, but also throw off cash to the shareholders, it's tough. It's tough to think that all through. So I spend the better part of 50 to 60 hours a week studying. Then I cram all my writing and customer service and everything else into about 20 hours. So when people see me reading all the time, well, you're just reading. And then they ask me, well, how many hours a week do you work? I go, well, it depends. Do you count the reading? No, that's not work. Oh, well, then I work 20 hours a week. But how do you do so well? Well, it's because of the 50 or 60 hours a week of reading I do. And they don't get it. Well, that's really how you become a great investor, is you read everything. This was the greatest advice that Jim Rogers ever got, according to him. Jim Rogers, famous commodity and cycle investor, he was George Soros' partner uh, with uh, the Quantum Fund back in the 70s, became a, a multimillionaire and retired at 37 years old. He's the guy that jumped on a Harley Davidson, drove it around the world, of course, had to throw on a boat from time to time, and then he did it again uh, with his fiance. He souped up a Mercedes, and he drove that around the world, again, throwing it on a boat from time to time. What can I do to become a great investor? Read everything. Read the corporate reports. Read all the filings. Read the industry journals. Read what their competitors are doing. If you just read everything, you'll have done more work than 99% of the other investors out there, and you'll win. You'll make a lot of money. Jim Rogers, that's what he said. He said, that's the best advice I ever got. It wasn't build a trading system. It wasn't use AI to try to skim. It wasn't, you know, use insider information. Just read everything. Truly know the businesses that you're going to invest in. Warren Buffett talks about that all the time. So I'm just coming back to my roots a little bit. And the way I present things to you it really won't be a, a big change because in the last quarter, I already updated the way that I was presenting the information to you. This is the theta. This is the thesis of a company. This is what we're watching. And this is how we will accumulate or trim the stock as appropriate based on prices. Warren Buffett says the best holding period is forever. Yeah, in a perfect scenario. But if you look at his portfolio, they trim an ad all the time. Sure, they might be an apple forever, but sometimes more of it, sometimes less of it. And that's what you have to learn how to do. If you get to know 30 companies, and I'm saying 30 to give you some wiggle room to keep your position sizes a little bit smaller to protect you. But if you can understand about 30 companies well, and that's no small task, but if you can understand about 30 companies well, and you understand when they're about to go on a big cyclical run-up, 
where you understand when they're about to go through a CapEx cycle that's going to beat up the stock a little bit. If you understand those things, you'll kick the crap out of the market because the market barely reads anything, much less reading almost everything. Where AI actually will help you if you buy one is in the scanning of documents, looking for specific pieces of information that because you read everything previously, a couple of 10Ks, industry reports, what the competitors are doing, that when you get the quarterly reports, you can say, okay, I know that this and this and this are the three things, and it usually is only three things, that I have really got to see if anything changed. And if something changed, we ask why. Somebody asked me in the comments of, I don't remember which article it was, I think it was about Teladoc. What do you think earnings are going to be like this quarter? They may guess what my reply was. Three words. I don't care. It's not what I'm looking for. Earnings are backwards looking. You should know about what the earnings are going to be doing over the next year or two today. And what difference does it make if that line wiggles a little bit? Now, turning over or bending up over a period of time is important. But little wiggles? Who cares? That's clouds in the sky. What difference does it make? I want to know if their sales numbers are going up quarter after quarter. I want to know how big the sales are. I want to know how long the contracts are. I want to know that they're stacking up recurring revenue quarter after quarter after quarter, while their CapEx and the other spending stays about the same. Spire Global. We got into that one way too early. We got two posters on Seeking Alpha who talk shit about that stock pick all the time, and they've been doing it for two years. They literally come back to the article to talk shit. The stock's down 85%, man. You're dumb. Well, first off, we didn't buy much of it until a few months ago. So we should have had a two-year healthy getting-to-know-you period while a starter position got beat up. And then backed into that stock about the time of the reverse split. And it's about even since then. And we just watched the recurring revenue stack up. $100 million, $130 million, $160 million. Well, the CapEx period for launching all the satellites is long gone. And all they have to do is maintenance now. Can't always tell you when crowds who are a bunch of know nothings are going to decide to charge into a stock. What I can tell you are the spots that it's most likely to happen. Micro caps that become small caps. That is a key spot. What am I talking about? Stocks that are about to get onto the Russell 2000 often go from a couple hundred million dollars to a billion very fast. Talk about market cap. Why? Because suddenly they get this huge influx of institutional investing because the ETFs, once it's in the Russell 2000, have to buy that stock. Case study of Metis. Metis was as high as $27, $28 a share after it got into the Russell 2000. There is a stigma by maybe a quarter of investors, maybe a third, on the high side, a third. But there's a group of investors out there that anything tied to clean energy, they don't want to invest in because of their politics. Even though clean energy stocks as a group have generally outperformed the S&P 500. So a Metis got beat up because there was a short attack on a low float but low interest stock. A stock that people weren't investing in because it was small, didn't pay a dividend, and my God, it had something to do with clean energy. The stock went down to a buck and a half. 95% drop. And on the lowest day that it traded, I gave you an update. I said, I'm buying not only a stock, but I'm buying calls. And for the next week, we piled into that stock and the calls. A lot of you trimmed your call positions up. I did. I told you in the chat room I had to because I manage other people's money. Would be prudent not to take some off the table. So now I still have call positions that are free. Stock position is basically paid for through the puts that we sold and the appreciation that we've gotten. And here's what we know. We know the stock is probably going to get added back to the Russell 2000 got removed going into that dollar fifty moment and weirdly the stock reacted to being removed from the Russell 2000 before the shares were actually taken out those two three million shares when they finally came out did not change the stock price in fact stock price went up because somebody was sitting there waiting to buy those shares those shares did not dump into the market in one day Russell sold black Blackrock sold they run IWM and somebody was there to buy those shares, representing 6 or 7% of the total shares and about 10 times the average volume at the time. Stock would have plummeted. Rather, it was on the way up. Why? Because you don't always get the trading information in real time, and especially not ahead of time. If you did get it trading information ahead of time, you'd be Ken Griffin, that cheating son of a bitch. I've been picking on Citadel for a while now. 
So now suddenly Metis is going up, up 6% again today, almost to 5 bucks again after hitting a rally up to 8 And here's what you should be asked. In their case, you can ask about the earnings, but what you really want to know is how big are the India contracts going to be? When is the next ITC credit? When are the next tax revenues hit? When's the next USDA loan going to get hit? And it's dropped $53 million to the balance sheet. They said $30 million was applied to equity. What does that mean? Well, you're going to find out at earnings in a few weeks. It probably means that they did something with the preferred shares that Proter X Corporation owns. Metis is such a good company that other corporations have invested in them. Jeremy Grantham has invested in them. And pretty soon, they're going to be back on the Russell 2000. About two-something million shares are going to get bought by IWM. And more shares by the other ETFs. There's only 37 million shares outstanding. 60% of them are in the hands of insiders institutions. Somewhere between 5 and 10% are in the hands of me, you, and a handful of other investors that I follow and that follow me. So you're looking at maybe 30% of the stock, about 10 million shares, that could conceivably be available. The ETFs are going to soak up probably around 3 million shares. And what happens? Some hedge funds get in ahead of time. See, the things I'm rambling off, if you read and read and read, you'll know. And that's why the punch card stocks are so important. I want you to constantly think about what it is you're investing in and why. Stop asking the question, hey, Kirk, what do you think about this? The, the, the red and green line wiggled a little bit. How come? You're not freaking Yogi Bear. Do the reading. And use the search function in the investment letters because these are the types of articles you'll find out there now. I had been putting these articles in a bunch of small notes that you had to piece together. I'm going to write one big thesis article on each company so that you have something core to go to. I don't like doing it because it takes half a day, maybe a day, when I can just put out 20 notes over the period of a couple months. But I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to put together these big involved articles, start with how we analyze investments, study the secular trends, the government and central bank policy affecting the company, fundamental and financial factors within the framework of a standard SWOT analysis, technical and quant analysis, price movements for a stock, which signal developing uptrends and downtrends. And the other thing that price movement tells us sometimes, especially near bottoms and tops, is what the big money is doing. And really the big money is way more important than the little money that runs around screaming, ah, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to buy it, I'll put it on Reddit, put it on Twitter, i talk about it. I've pretty much stopped using Twitter. You can call it X all he wants. They're both dumb names. So innovative industrial, secular trends supporting it. What's its policy impact? Strengths of the company, weaknesses, some opportunities, some threats. The opportunities section is usually, if you get this right, that means you probably got everything else right because this is the hard part, understanding the business opportunities. If you can figure this one out, you're going to win technical and quant analysis. With this one, I decided to compare it to the ETFs that are out there in cannabis. And I showed top holdings and the two biggest cannabis ETFs. And then who pays rent to innovative? What you found is that Green Thumb, Cure Leaf, and True Leaf are big components of all three. The difference between IIPR and MJ and MSOS, some structural things with who they're doing business with, for sure. But these guys are charging big management fees, and they have to inv- invest in swaps because not all the stocks are on U.S. exchanges, and that's expensive. Meanwhile, companies that they're buying stock in, they collect rent from, and then they kick off a 9% plus dividend to you from this price. And one of their opportunities is that as cannabis becomes more legal, and more of it, the cannabis market shifts from the illegal market to the legal market, this is the big shift to watch is that the company could literally triple or quadruple in size over the next decade as more marijuana goes through the legal channels and, you know, stuffed under the wheel well of a pickup truck. And as it gets into beverages and food, the added margin of safety for innovative is that those greenhouses can be used for food. We know that three to 5% of farmland globally is disappearing every year, mainly from climate change, but also from development. Development is more eating into the forests and the the farmland. I know that seems funny in America where in the suburbs, the farms turn into houses, but throughout the rest of the world, they develop forests and farmland just gets washed away. And there's something north of a 
billion acres, I believe it was, billion three, something like that, acres of farmland that have just been abandoned. Why? Nobody wants to live there. There's not a new generation to take it over. And that farmland just becomes, you know, junk. Now, it could be reworked, for sure. But in a world with less farmland, and I cite Will Allen here, who is from Milwaukee, pioneered greenhouse growing and vertical farming, that's coming. There's no doubt that that's coming. Planet's getting hotter. And those people who don't invest in clean energy and things that are related to climate change impact. I've got an article in the can. I think I started writing it two years ago. Just put the title in the outline. Something along the lines of climate change deniers are going to get wiped out. And they are. The environment's changing so fast that people are already moving around the world by the millions. This is something that's been featured in the quadrennial report, the quadrennial defense review from the Pentagon since the Bush administration. That's one of the five biggest risks, do you know that, to the United States and, and globally is climate change migration. That's what the Pentagon thinks. The Pentagon makes it a top five risk. People are bitching and moaning about the southern border right now, right? Many of those people have moved because they can't farm where they were anymore because the industry fell apart. And many others are just oppressed by dictators. Probably let 500,000 people from Venezuela, people in Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, India, all suffering from massive climate catastrophes, which include washing the farmland away. So the backdoor investment in innovative industrial, if cannabis doesn't remain a big profit center, is we're probably going to have to start growing a lot more of our food in greenhouses. Well, there you go. Here's the biggest one in the world. So some bullet points, kind of the too long, didn't read version. And my intention is to have a full position in IIPR by the end of the year. Now, the rest of the articles for the punch card stocks are going to end up being like that. There's two new stocks on the list. I'm not going to show you the whole list because this is going out to the wide world. And if I give you my whole list, maybe this is the one that goes viral, and I don't want that. Added WEC Energy. They own We Energies, Wisconsin Electric. And they are 60% owner of American Transmission Company. I'll have a stock rover report in here in this article as a new addition. It's not cheap enough to buy just yet. It was when we first talked about it a few weeks back. It was down around 77. If it gets back to that price, you can buy it again. Essentially, you want to buy WEC Energy anytime the dividend yield is about 4%. This is one of the more growthy utilities out there. Not going to get 6 7%. It's never priced that cheap. They pay out over 3 bucks a share. We'll figure out how to get into that. And then I added Sun Run back to the punch card stocks. I had taken it off a couple years ago. And now it's down, you know, a zillion percent or something. So we can uh, take a look at that. Our new writer, Bill Zettler, convinced me to add Suncor to the uh, very short list. Um, I don't think it's cheap enough to buy right now under my uh, criteria that I need a double within five years to make it worth my while. But he makes a pretty compelling argument that it can run to about 50 in the next year. So take a look at this article. If you really want more oil exposure, he doesn't quite understand the peak oil plateau concept yet, but I'll learn them. Basically, the peak oil plateau is the idea that oil demand, not supply, oil demand is flattening. We know that's a fact. I mean, it's very easy to look at the numbers and know that's a fact. That the growth rate for oil use has been under 1% for rolling five-year periods for about a decade now. Sure, you have a year or two that's up a bunch. From 2020 to 2021, there was a big growth rate. That's because nobody used any oil in 2020. So you look at the rolling periods, there's really no growth for oil demand anymore. And as electric vehicles continue to take market share, in many parts of the world, they're over 10% of new car sales. In the United States are about 5 6%, but it'll be 10% soon. And we've been talking about EV since 2020, so we should be prepared. Now, I know there's a lot of new people here. But since the Consumer Electronics Show in, in January of 2020, I've been telling you, 2026 and 2027, 2027 in particular, are going to be the years where EV sales like go straight up. So it might take us three years to go from 5% to 10%, but then from 10% to 50% might happen in two years of new car sales being EVs. And we're probably going to make a run at 80% of cars being sold by 2030 or 31 being EVs. How can I say that? Because the car companies are telling us they're going to stop making gasoline cars, only keeping a handful of models, mainly trucks. So 
because we read and we know that Ford and GM and Volkswagen and Volvo and BMW and Mercedes and Stellantis are all phasing out gasoline-powered cars starting in 2027 through 2035. We know, simple thing. Like, well, 7 or 8% of the cars every year go into to the junkyard. So if in 2027, EV sales, because of what's being offered, go way up, and 7 or 8% of the gasoline cars go to the junkyard, where does your growth for oil demand come from at that point? The answer is, is that there is none. By 2026 to 2027, we'll be starting the other part of the curve where there's actual demand destruction. And it will be minimal into the early 2030s, but then you're going to start seeing it fall off a cliff. So oil demand, you know, from plus 1% a year to negative 1% a year for the next decade, that's a plateau, essentially, correct? No change in oil demand, that's a plateau. A peak oil plateau, I've been calling it since 2016 or something, 2015. Should we check my math? There you go. 2014, I started talking about it. Oh, this is the article where I told people to start selling oil stocks after three years of telling them to buy oil stock. You want to check this one out. So as I follow, follow companies, I try to figure out what they're going to do, and I read up on them. I ask questions like, what will the demand be like in a few years? And that'll tell you things. So a Suncor, they're in what's called the runout period of their business. What is the runout period of a business? It's that period of a business where they really don't reinvest back into the company. And they suck as much money out as they can. So Suncor has about two to three decades of pretty easy to get at oil in their reserves. They don't really have to do much work to get it. They just scoop it out and process it, right? Everything's known. CapEx is built. The sunken upfront costs are sunk. And they can make money at $35, $40 a barrel, which remember, historically, is about average. What else is going to happen with oil two, three, four years out that we've already started to see happen in a couple of countries? They have oil. They're short on energy, so they burn their own oil. They try to sell it first, then they burn it. Now you have turmoil in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia doesn't want to get sucked into a war with Iran. African nations want to get wealthy. You're going to get panic pumping, and it already has actually started in a few countries. I've been calling it panic pumping for two years, three years now. Again, saying that it would come in the middle of the decade. You got your first couple of examples. There's going to be more. So with demand not going up anymore, really, and about to turn over and go negative, and a couple decades of known reserves around the world. Remember, known reserves are based on price. So as price goes down, known reserves go down, right? That, that, that term is based on economic viability. They can know about the oil, but if it's not profitable to get it out of the ground, it doesn't really count anymore. Unless you're early frackers and you just drill baby drill. So read the Suncor article. I think it is a good way to look at the world in a future context. You know, that whole run out concept, I've talked about it with bars before. Ever been to a bar when you were younger and it was just awesome? You know, it was fun. The TVs were new. It was clean. It didn't stink. The floor wasn't nicked up. The bar wasn't nicked up. You go back 10 years later, 15 years later, and it's just a dingy place. Why? Because the owner didn't take care of it. Just sucking out as much money as he can before he retires and sells it to the next guy with a with a hope and a dream for having a, having a bar. Restaurants do it too. People stop investing in their restaurants and they get dingy and crummy. Chef leaves, food get wor gets worse. So I keep track of my stocks. I read up on them. One of the things that I would show you is this. This is Stock Rover. I said it's just a great way to track things. And it's cheap. Five-year price to the free cash flow. A lot of stocks are still pretty expensive. Barrett Gold, right? Why would it be expensive to its free cash flow? What do they have a lot of to get gold out of the ground? A lot of CapEx. You need to understand the CapEx of a company. How much does it cost to produce widgets? How much does it cost to get an ounce of gold out of the ground? My answer is about $1,100. So yeah, if the price of gold goes up to $3,000, they will make more money, but they'll also be depleting their gold. And remember what we talked about this summer? I told you it's been coming for a couple of years. Again, a lot. I've been saying a lot of things since 2020. What did we launch last week? We, let, oh, we launched a rocket, go to that asteroid, figure out how we can mine it. It's loaded with gold and diamonds and iron. And copper. I was talking to my nephew yesterday, freshman in high school, talking, talked about that that uh, ship. I said, you know, your generation is going to be studying space a lot more. 
he's kind of excited about that. Said, did you see what they launched last week? No. The ship that's going to go to the asteroid, they're going to mine it. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's great because we're going to run out of everything. I said, nah. The problem with resources on this planet isn't that we don't have them. Take a look at where the planet's been mined. We could mine in a thousand other places and get stuff. The problem is it destroys the environment for miles around and the water. The benefit of mining the asteroid is that all the pollution is in space. So we can shift the pollution to space, the environmental impact to space. All we have to do is figure out, okay, how can we get the stuff out of space for about the same price we can get it on Earth? And you know technology will figure that out. When you read, you find things out like, hey, we need a lot more satellites from companies like Spire Global. Because it's not just visual, it's the radio frequency that becomes important. If in 10 years, Spire Global is a 10-bagger, am I still an idiot for having spotted the company a little early and taken a starter position? Now, my cost basis on Spire Global, I'm only down like 30% because we scaled in slowly and at wide price points. And it took a couple years because the market is irrational, especially in small and mid cap. But even large caps. With large caps, they're mainly irrationally overpriced, not underpriced. And that's where most of the danger is, in the large cap. So I've taken a look at some FS Insights stuff over the weekend. They have a little earnings report. I'll mix this into our uh, analysis. But the earnings reports are, uh, you know, the numbers don't really matter that much. They, they just truly don't. You're looking for the trend. And what we know is that earnings probably bottomed out in the last couple quarters, but probably won't really surge until energy prices come down and AI has had a little bit more time. So we're probably in a plateau on earnings for a little while too. Talks about the shorter term movements. Um, like I said, I know Mark, I've known Mark a decade and he's very good. However, should we really be trading in the first place? In most cases, no. I pick some trades here and there that I think are high conviction. But for the most part, there's not a lot of trading to be done. Very simple, selling puts when something's oversold, selling cover calls when something's overbought. And make sure that your valuations are either a little high or a little low when you make those trades. <clears throat> Newton and FS Insight talk about gold. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that in the past year, gold is this blue line. Arc W is a lighter blue line. And Bitcoin is that orange line. And last November is when I told you to start buying Bitcoin. All the pounders, uh, buy gold, it's going to the moon, blah, 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 blah. No, it might be coming from beyond the moon. The Bitcoin versus gold chart is going to keep looking at it like this. Bitcoin is going to six figures. I say it all the time. Hear me now, believe me later. Buy some freaking Bitcoin. I know it went up a lot today again. Still under 30000 Take a look at the last six months, last three months. There you go. ARC is getting beat up. This is probably an opportunity. Yeah, it hasn't started to move up yet. ARC is up today. The ARC W is up today. Why do we like ARC W? It's got a Bitcoin position. It owns Square. It owns a lot of e commerce. As the logistics shake out with e commerce, they will become more and more profitable. They will start capturing the same type of money that Walmart has captured, which is why Walmart is getting into e commerce as much as they can. Keep an eye on this. I will have my outlook out before I go to Las Vegas and Phoenix next week. I'm going to visit the mother-in-law. Go to Las Vegas for a few days to see the U2 show at the Spear. It's the most money I've ever spent on a concert, so I don't know. We'll see if there's a Thursday webinar next week. I'm sure there will be. I'll probably play the U2 video beforehand. Um, remember I told you that the one thing that could really screw up the economy and change Fed policy and, and throw a haymaker to the stock market is if oil prices went up for some reason. Well, this is some reason. And it's almost, you know, Hamas picked a spot. It wasn't just about making the point that they want to make, as much as I disagree with it, but it was put there, create a divide. Not just to say, hey, we deserve, deserve a state, but it was done just like the oil was manipulated, just like the supply chains were manipulated. This is another manipulation, multiple purposes. They want to screw up the economy, and Iran has been saber-rattling. This is the thing that could be a problem for the global economy and the stock market. It's also what could change Fed policy and push interest rates down. So this is the thing that I've warned about that could eventually happen. We'll see if it's really going to happen or if this is going to cool down in a couple of weeks. I think that it is quite possible that we see a spike in oil because Iran gets involved in a war with Israel. 
and the United States gets involved more than we want to. And by the time Saudi Arabia pumps more oil and, you know, however it is they extract it, you know, things from us, you know, the, however Saudi Arabia cuts the deal the, for more oil with the United States, protection, money, access, who knows. The reality is it's a blip and you'll want to sell your oil investments into it. So if Exxon and XLE, which we own XLE, if those spike, you're looking for an exit opportunity. If Suncor goes to 50 really quick, you're looking for an exit opportunity. You want to keep the companies that are transitioning and have a viable path to transitioning to clean energy because they'll make the most in the long run. By far, it won't even be close. Much easier to make money off the sun than it is off the oil. All right. Went through a lot of things. I will finish this tonight. It's already mostly done. And take a look at this innovative article. And if you're watching and you're not a member of one of my services, take a look at Fundamental Trends. Uh, however, I did launch a dividend-only service on Seeking Alpha um, today. It hasn't posted yet, but it will be a dividend-only service on Seeking Alpha. It's only 199 bucks a year. If you only want dividends and you don't want chat room and you don't want all the other analysis, you get two dividend picks every month. We'll see how long I do that. I don't want to undercut my main service. There is some math involved with that too. All right, focus on this. Focus on learning about the companies that you invest in. Take the time to read a quarterly report. Try to understand the accounting, but really just read read the verbiage. Read 30 or 40 pages about a company that you're putting your hard-earned money into. All right, I got to help somebody with their taxes, and I got to throw mine in the mail or go see my accountant and have them zip them over there. Have a good rest of the week. I will see you on Thursday.